Well, we are going to be continuing in on our exposition of the Gospel of Mark this morning, and we are starting a new chapter. And so you can open your Bible and flip to Mark chapter 10. We'll be in the first 12 verses. And so as I hear the the glorious sound of pages turning as you get there, it's kind of set us up for today. As you know, I've been describing the Gospel of Mark as uh, kind of like a movie trailer. It's fast paced. You get all of these scenes really quickly and somehow always come up with a movie reference to kind of set us up where we're going in the text this morning. And so this morning, we're going to have a, a movie that's all about a trap, really, in a way. We see this coming in. Probably the most famous movie uh, about a trap where things get flipped around is a classic that you watch every Christmas season, Home Alone. Home Alone is all about what? Joe Pesci and Marv and the, the wet bandits, they're going to get this kid. They've got him trapped, but he flips everything back on them. This morning in the text, as you will see in just a moment, we have a trap that gets flipped around and then it's used to show the genius, no, actually the saving work of Jesus and his love for the scriptures as the word made flesh. This morning, would you uh, open your Bible to Mark chapter 10, we'll be in the first 12 verses. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came uh, up and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said unto them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery adultery. Thus says the living word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we dedicate this time unto you. Would you uh, guide us by the same Holy Spirit who breathed out the very scriptures that we seek to examine? And by the power of that same Holy Spirit, would you let this word be implanted into our hearts that would allow us to bear fruit in keeping with repentance 30, 60, and 100 fold. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we begin the 10th of 16 chapters of Mark this morning. I want to refresh you as we keep going because we're really far into this with some some big ideas, four big ideas to make sure we're all on the same contextual page, all right? Four highlights to get us where we're going. Firstly, Mark can be divided into three sections. Chapters one through mid eight uh, describe the questions in the text of who is this Jesus? Who is this guy? The midpoint of chapter 8 is called the great confession with Peter confessing, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Savior. And then the last seven and a half chapters, so to speak, are all about what does that mean exactly and what does that mean for his followers, right? Big idea number one. Number two, the healing of the blind man in two stages at the start of chapter 8 acts as an interpretive parable for the whole last half of the book of Mark. The blind man had his sight restored in two stages by Jesus. Remember, Jesus spit and then rubbed his eyes. First it was fuzzy. People look like walking trees. And then he does it again and everything is clear. The last half of the book is all fuzzy until the very end. Thirdly, Jesus has been proclaimed as Savior And he begins to teach he must suffer and die and then be glorified. He then begins teaching these fuzzy-sided disciples of his that any who follow after him as citizens of the kingdom of God will live similar lives uh, that are opposite of the world, right? To live that you die, the greatest shall be last, the first, uh, the, the last shall be first, all these things. And then lastly, number four, Jesus spends the last half of Mark chapter 9, where we've camped out the past few weeks, teaching that God's people are not just this group of 12 or a couple around them, but all over the place. Any who would have faith in Jesus are part of God's family, all disciples being like royal children in the kingdom of God. All right, we're caught up. We're all on the same page to begin a new chapter of Mark this morning. And so in the text before us, 
Mark further showcases how Jesus is clearing up this fuzzy-sided group of people and also us as well. We as readers may not see it clearly right at the start since what Mark presents us with here in the first verses of chapter 10 seem non sequitur, disconnected from where we left off last week in Mark 9, 50, which spoke about what fleeing sin, lopping off hands and, and feet and plucking out eyes if it causes you to sin, not causing others to stumble, living a life of sacrifice as Christ did. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, I truly believe that we can receive a little bit more spiritual spittle this morning upon the eyes of our heart to have this text really show us how everything is connected and why it's positioned here with some of these big ideas that we may not see uh, clearly at first. So as we come to Mark this morning, verse 1, we have a change in location from Capernaum to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, which is actually called the region of Perea. So Judea, Perea, they rhyme, you will never forget it. Uh, Capernaum is in the northern Israel, uh, land of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. And then Judea, uh, which has Jerusalem at its center, and then Perea are all in the south down by the Dead Sea and the Jordan River. Okay, everybody know their geography well. You got the map in your head, right? This is where, if you've been diving into a word well read on Wednesday nights with us, that you can you can put this to work, can't you? You know what to do here. Let's look at some geographical context because it's actually quite consequential to the interpretation of this passage. When we read Mark ten one, we, we we fly out of the house of Capernaum and we're. Here we are. We're in Perea now. We get the impression that Capernaum and the area of Judea and Perea are close, like Mount Sterling and Camargo or Mount Sterling and Winchester. You know, relatively pretty close. However, they're not. The the southern regions, Judea, Perea, all these things, they're actually about 70 miles away from where Jesus is in Capernaum. This would have been, at at best, a week-long journey, if not 10 or 12 days long. We must remember that Mark is is the the movie trailer gospel. It's doing flybys. Uh, Furthermore, Jesus actually, he actually spends a considerable amount of time in this area uh, doing ministry, about six months uh, worth, and Mark just, really, he skips just about all of it. It's not that it doesn't matter, He's got another purpose here. If you want to read about the Judean ministry of Jesus, you can read it. Uh, And and John, I believe it starts in chapter 7, and then Luke also gives a chunk of his account to the Judean ministry. But why not Mark? Why is that? You may be wondering that. It's because Mark has a different secondary purpose in writing his gospel. The primary is, of course, the person and work of Jesus Christ, the glorious gospel of the kingdom. But the secondary is to ensure this fast-paced, crashed course on what? Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? He's the Christ. What does that mean? Suffering and glory? We do not understand. You will. Here's the cross. There's the empty tomb. Now, who do you say he is? See that? That's how it works. After the great confession of Peter and and the Mount of Transfiguration, Mark literarily rushes us as fast as he can towards Jerusalem and Jesus' triumphal entry and the betrayal and death and resurrection. He is rushing us from fuzzy sight to clear sight. That's what he's doing. That's why it's just boom, 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 boom. Where did those six months go? I don't know. I I, I like to think of it like this. Remember uh, that it's widely considered that Mark, the Gospel of Mark, was penned by John Mark, a relative of the Apostle Peter, and that he scribed this Gospel account as Peter's version of the gospel or, or, or kind of what he wanted to tell about Jesus. And, and really, this is just some, some artistic license here. I can imagine during the process, Peter telling Mark or corresponding with Mark kind of like this, you know, yeah, after, after I confessed Jesus as the Christ and, you know, he rebuked me, I saw him glorified on the mountain. I, man, everything was a blur after that. And like, next thing I, I know, we're in Jerusalem, and I'm sitting in the courtyard, and I, I hear the, the rooster crow after denying him, and, and he's dying, and then uh, I'll, I'll tell you the rest later, right? I kind of feel like that's really fast-paced. So with this historic background 
in mind, Jesus again comes to this southern area, which is the geographical area of Jerusalem, and he conducts what is known as his Judean ministry. And Mark gives us in verse one, such a, he does such a Mark thing. Mark does such a Mark thing. Just this pithy statement. People came to him, great crowds. He taught them. All right, six months worth of ministry in three words, pretty much, right? There he is. But verse uh, two actually picks up on the meat of this particular uh, passage. Uh, verse one acts as one of those great Mark and Bridge texts. He's, he's rushing us over to another side here. So verse two says this, Pharisees came up and in order to test him asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? I always hear the Pharisees with like this snooty English voice, like they're butlers or something. It's lawful for a man to divorce his wife. The bad actors are back, aren't they? Right? The Jewish law experts are back trying to trap and trick Jesus. Why? Because they want him dead. They want him dead. Remember back in Mark 3, 6, that they start conspiring with the Herodians, the, the Jewish royal family, so to speak, with quotations around that, who they didn't even like. They didn't even like those people on how they could just kill Jesus, get him out of the way. He's, he, he's affecting their influence. He's speaking what they think to be blasphemy, that he's a son of God. They think that he's empowered by Satan, right? And they're all scared that him saying that the kingdom of God has come is going to result in Rome coming down hard on the Jews and starting a war and maybe even, even a, a genocide. So they come and in order to test him, excuse me, they question him. There's an ulterior motive here. We can already sense it. We've already seen this before. They have tested him at the start of Mark 8 and verse 11. They're asking for him, remember, show us a sign from heaven when, when he'd been showing them all kinds of stuff. So you faithless, wicked generation. And wouldn't you know it, the word for test here, the, the word that's used that the Pharisees try to test him with this question, it's the same word used to describe the testing of Jesus in the wilderness by Satan. So let me ask you this morning at the start here, whose children do you believe these religious leaders are? Are they children of God or of the enemy? No wonder they're called a brood of vipers, right? All right, let's just pause. Stop. Everybody okay? Ooh. What kind of questions this? What kind of questions this? Seriously, this is, this is an odd question. I want you to ask yourself, why this question? Why this question? Sure doesn't seem to be like a snaring inquiry at all, does it? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Like if somebody randomly came up to me on the street or something in Kroger and asked me that, I'd be like, what? where's this coming from, right? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be this way if we actually are attached to the historical and geographical context. Beyond the Jordan, this region of beyond the Jordan, Perea was due east of Jerusalem, and this was the area where the Herod family ruled. They had a fortress over here. This was Herod's region where he reigned as a lackey for Rome. All right, okay, so what? You're telling us all this geography. Well, well, okay, hold on. Remember old cousin John the baptizer? Remember him? Camel hair, ate locust, honey, was kind of weird. Right, remember him? The Elijah to come, remember that? Everybody shake their head if you remember that. Yep, okay, right. The forerunner of this Messiah, well, where's he at now? He's dead, right? But what was the cause of his demise? Do you remember? Mark 6, verses 17 through 19. It was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. The ultimate human circumstance that cost John the baptizer his life was him speaking out against the marriage of Herod and his sister-in-law, who she left so she could marry Herod. You see how insidious these snakes are now, right? All right, oh, this perfect time. It couldn't be any better. Couldn't be any better. 
Jesus is in Herod's land. Let's get him to start talking about marriage and divorce and make Herod and Herodias mad at him like they were at John and they'll kill him too. Hey, hey, hey. I think his head would look pretty good on a silver platter too. What do you think? <laughs> right? Snake tongue. It's insidious. But Jesus, being God in the flesh, knows exactly what they're doing. Right, we expect him to just absolutely spike volley back here, but he throws the trap back at them by causing them to come into the house with all of its swinging paint cans like Kevin had on Home Alone. Now, many commentators comment on what I'm about to likewise comment on, namely that Jesus doesn't give his opinion, but goes to the authority of scripture, which is absolutely right. It's absolutely right. But for some reason, some reason, many miss the satiric nature of this account right here, this little back and forth, right? These guys were supposed experts in the law, the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, they come to him and say, is it, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And you can, you can kind of hear Jesus now that we know this background, the, the historical background uh, and the, uh, the uh, geographical context, like, oh boy, all right. Well, you're the law experts. Remember, I'm just some dumb old demon-possessed handyman. You tell me. It's not just that Jesus responds by upholding the authority of Scripture, but that he's jabbing these self-righteous so-called law experts right in the ribs. You tell me, what did Moses say? As in, school me on the law whose author was Moses. Well, the Pharisees, oh man, they whip out that serpentine forked tongue and they just, they rear back like they're getting ready to strike. They've got Jesus. Here we go. I, yes. They quote Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, which is actually the only explicit reference to divorce regulation in the entire Old Testament. Four verses. Moses, the lawgiver, said, a man could write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Ha, ha, ha. Right? Now, this is an extremely loose interpretation of Deuteronomy 24 and is, far, is actually more or less focused on uh, the commentary of Jewish rabbis or teachers of the law that had uh, been elevated to the place of authority over the scriptures, right? Just like back in Mark chapter seven with this same group getting uppity about hygiene and dietary laws, you know, Jesus said, making the tradition of the elders stand over scripture so that that's what they're doing here as well. Briefly, this is, this is why it's loose. Uh, Second Temple Judaism, which was obviously around in the time of Jesus, uh, it actually mirrored our modern two-party political system because uh, we only have two parties, I promise you that. Uh, you, you had a side that really built their, vision, their version of Judaism off of a rabbi named Hillel, and he was just, for, for generalization's sake, he was kind of liberal, okay? He took Deuteronomy 24 uh, and, and came up with uh, teachings that said a man could divorce his wife for pretty much any reason, and these are actual reasons, okay? So men, we're not done with the sermon right here. Cut it out, okay? Right? If she burned your food, here's a good one. I think this one's funny. If she showed her ankles in public, if she was ugly, or if you just didn't like her, right? You had buyer's remorse. Right? No fault divorce is not a modern invention. It's been around for thousands of years. Really, it's been around forever. The other camp uh, were conservatives, so to speak, and they followed a rabbi named Shammai, and he really essentially said, no, you, it, that's not how this works. You can't, it's just not no fault. It has to be something serious, something extremely scandalous, like uh, adultery or, you know, something like that. So the Pharisees, conspiring with the Herodians on how to get rid of Jesus back in Mark 3, 6, uh, what position do you think that they held to? Right? Divorce her for any reason. Divorce her for any reason. So they think they've got Jesus. They think that they're about to strike him and inject all this venom in him. But here's the thing. Jesus actually has them. No doubt, they've quoted the law. 
Deuteronomy 24, Moses' second giving of the law, his last will and testament. But they've cherry-picked the verse out of context and disregarded the weightier matters of the law, which Moses also wrote in order to teach his doctrines of God, the commandments of men. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 5. Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. Deuteronomy 24 does not command divorce. Deuteronomy 24 does not give law about how to divorce as if it's part of God's design. Deuteronomy 24 is what is known as divine accommodation. God knowing sinful man will find ways to sin and God creating guardrails to keep them from going completely off the cliff, especially for Israel, as this is the nation from which he has uh, foreordained for the Messiah to come from, right? He's keeping them safe. Deuteronomy 24, I encourage you to, to read it, is essentially a regulation on, uh, on how to regulate divorce when it happens because of human hardness of heart that will find any excuse to commit this act. But here's the thing, here's the thing. Deuteronomy 24 was really a safeguard for women and children, right? In the ancient Near Eastern society, women and children did not have the rights that they do today, which have come from the church. So these regulations were uh, meant to make sure that that the woman was able to be taken care of, the children were taken care of. And Jesus says this commandment was given because of the hardness of sinful human hearts and that pointing to regulations for sin is not the answer. That's not the answer. Jesus essentially says, okay, yes, that's in the scriptures, but you're ripping that out of context. You're still arguing from tradition with a proof text. With a proof text. He then goes on to quote Genesis 1 and 2, which was also written by Moses. Mark 10, 6 through 9, quoting Genesis 1 and 2. From beginning of creation, God made them female, I'm sorry, male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus appeals to scripture, but in context. He claims it as authoritative. And notice something. He claims it as authoritative over every human being. Notice that. He does not just say, therefore, Jews and Christians are no longer two, but one according to this word, all marriage, all people. The scriptures are the authority, the standard for everybody. And Jesus says the design from, from day six, right, not day one because, you know, man, day six, was one man, one woman. One man, one woman. Pause. Pause again. Everybody okay? This is really some profound stuff, right? My goodness. The Word of God is alive and active. I like to say it's timeless and timely, right? Simple Google search. You can do this as soon as we get out of this place. How many genders are there? First result, 72. 72. I've got more genders than Baskin Robin has ice cream flavors. Right? 72. Male and female, two. There are two genders. They don't change. They aren't fluid. Man, woman. That's it. That's it. Thank you. That's right. It's such a profound, like, oh, why would you say that? I, because until five minutes ago, the world knew this and lived this way. My goodness, this old dusty book, huh? Two genders, male, female. Oh, okay. Pause again. Everybody okay? I know. She, okay. Uh, also, God's design from the beginning is monogamous heterosexual marriage. No such thing as Adamina and Eve or Adam and Steve, okay? Heterosexual, monogamous, for life marriage. The issue of homosexuality was not an issue 
for the Jews. It certainly was for the Roman culture that was around this Jewish culture that Jesus also confronts, but the Jews here are his main audience and, and self-proclaiming Jewish religious experts of the law at that. But one thing that actually was an issue for them, that's kind of in the text behind it, had been an issue from the very beginning, and that was polygamy. Multiple wives at the same time. Jesus attacks that too. From the beginning, one man, one woman, they don't separate. That's it. Man, if Joseph Smith could have read this verse, he probably would not have been able to have found a giant cult and go find Utah, right? We wish he would have. What Jesus is doing here is saying to the Pharisees, you're asking the wrong question with the wrong heart. You're seeking an answer about divorce, such as, can we do it? Is, it? is it all right? It's a theological, minimalistic question. Minimizes. What's the bare minimum we have to do, and what can we get away with in the sight of God? The real question that they need to be asking is, what is marriage? Jesus points to the original man-woman pair of Adam and Eve and says, one man, one woman, like there were no other men or women upon the earth because in Adam and Eve's case, right? There weren't. The joining of man and woman in marriage creates a new entity, a new being. That, that's what birth and children are in a symbolic way, if you think about it. The joining of one man, one woman, two becoming one, creating one whole new human being. But also, there's some deep biblical symbolism here that I want to mention in passing. Right? God created Adam and declared it's not good for him to be alone. So God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, took one of Adam's ribs, and made the first woman Eve from his rib. If you need to read this, it's the first, first couple chapters of Genesis, right? Genesis chapter 2. What happens? Adam wakes up, beholds the gift from God that God has made for him, from him, and is floored by her. And he says that this is bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Then in Genesis 2.24 that Jesus quotes here in Mark 10, the two become one flesh. Catch that? You may not at first. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. In marriage, that which is not good for man to be alone, like he's missing a part of his body, is restored like Adam getting his rib back. There she is. Makes him whole. Jesus says what God has joined together as one new being, man can't separate. What God has joined together is one new being, let not man separate. All right, try and saw a person in half, right? And you know what you end up with? A murder warrant and a Netflix documentary. Okay, that's what happens. Uh, that's not how it works. That's not how it's designed. Jesus not only upholds the authority of Scripture, but he also upholds the extreme gravity and sanctity of marriage. He highlights that the covenant of marriage is not just some human system that people can get in and out of easily. It's the first institution given by God. His disciples still need some spiritual spittle, so they ask him in private, what do you mean by this? And he tells him in verses 11 and 12, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Matthew's account clarifies that adultery itself, since it is the act of joining with another body, is an act that permits divorce since it has happened in spirit and in a way physically. But remember, in context here of Mark, Jesus is dismantling the Pharisees' mentality of divorce for any reason, whatever reason, whenever. All right, if you do this, no fault for any reason of divorce, Jesus says. It breaks the seventh commandment jointly, right? You, you break it together, and then ironically, as he unfolds it, as one person, right? Uh, and then cause the other people that you marry after that, that these hypothetical people marry, to commit sin as well. All right, here's the thing. God not only hates unlawful divorce, Malachi chapter 2, but he hates adultery worse, Right? Divorce, in a way, is the lesser of two sins. And this is seen that in the same law that the Pharisees try to aha Jesus with, the very law of God, God says that the penalty for an adulterer is death. It's death. It's death. 
You know, we forget that in our culture, which downplays all of this much worse than any of the cultures before us. Jesus is spotlighting the supremacy and seriousness of the institution of the covenant of marriage in this chapter, in this verse of the chapter here. But before we move on to the application of this text to our lives, I said way back at the start of this sermon that you may be asking the question, why does Mark put this here? It doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the surrounding context. Well, at first sight, it's fuzzy, but here's some more spit. Right? What has Jesus spent the last chunk of the past chapter talking about? Radical discipleship. Faith in Jesus, your relationship with him and to him, then dying to self, putting others before yourself, being in harmony with others, not causing them to stumble, not causing yourself to stumble, which leads others to stumble with you and you both end up in hell. Now, hear Jesus' words again in light of Mark chapter 9. Whoever divorces his wife and commits and marries another commits adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Adultery, sin that causes others to sin. See how it all goes together, actually. Mark positions this text here to give us further clarification on how the life of a Christian disciple not only radically changes the individual, but also the relationships in that individual's life. The life of disciple of a disciple changes in its orientation to the Lord, to the self, and to others in general, to spouses, to children, to co-workers, bosses, kings, presidents, everyone, because a man is not alone. He lives his life in relation to God and to other men. All right, what relationship is more precious, more intimate, more vulnerable than marriage? Answer, besides that redeeming relationship of the Lord, nothing, none, okay? Pause again. Everybody all right? Before we get to application, I just want to state two uh, additional pastoral comments before we apply this text to our life this morning. I feel like they're very pertinent uh, to get out of the way. Uh, Firstly is this. The sermon, I want to be clear, is not about reasons for divorce. Should you, can you, have you, right? Some are here today who have gone through such a difficult division or been in a household as children that went through such a difficult division. Some as Christians before they came to Christ, some, uh, some after even. If this is you, your reason for having to go through such a difficult trial, my friend, it may have been biblical as in because of your spouse leaving you or because of adultery, or it may have been illegitimate. Right? Whatever the case may be, I, seek, uh, I call you to seek to the Lord in repentance and forgiveness, restoration, if you've gone through that. And if you've gone through that and want to talk more about that with me personally, about that situation, I would love to do that. This is not a sermon about reasons for it. Secondly, while the exception clause that Jesus gives in Matthew's account uh, of this is that marriage is dissolvable in the case of adultery, that does not mean that if such a sin occurs that the, dis- the uh, dissolving of the marriage is automatic. Right? God gave the law to show his holy character. The law contains maximum penalties. Death for adultery was a maximum penalty. Forgiveness and reconciliation has always been at the heart of God's gracious law. So let me exemplify what I'm saying with this. I personally know marriages where there has been adultery and it has been devastating as it should be. And yet I've likewise seen in these devastated marriages, supernatural grace extended, true forgiveness extended, true reconciliation extended, and somehow, some way beyond anything that we can fathom or describe by human means, that marriage comes out the other side even better, even stronger, even more Christ-like, even more grounded, even more full of love and intimacy and life. It's rare. It's rare. And when this happens, you want to talk about being able to cut the air with a knife in the sense of God's tangible grace. Oh man, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's a testament to his grace. The other side of this is the marriages where there is no such sin that has occurred between the husband and the wife, but they might as well be divorced. 
It's not physical adultery, but it's emotional and spiritual. They just simply cohabitate. They lose interest in one another. They don't pursue one another. Uh, One usually uh, starts withholding intimacy from the other, which is actually sinful. The scriptures say that. Uh, They start separating their lives while staying under the same roof, right? They start separating what God has joined. Separate bank accounts, separate beds, separate dinners, separate everything. A body sawn in two, not by an outside force, but self-inflicted. That's not the design either. It's not the design either. Thank you, brother. With all of this in mind, I call you to come as a disciple into the home and seek how to apply this passage to your life from God's word. While various ways of applying this text unto ourselves are, are, are fathomable, I want you to consider three points this morning. And I know what you're probably thinking right now, oh, it's going to be about marriage. Yes, but there's two others that we actually need to think about that are in the text, kind of behind it, that we need to rip apart and think about. Here they are. Number one, I ask you, are you a theological minimalist? Are you a theological minimalist? Number two, what is your standard? And thirdly, do you have a biblical view of marriage? Firstly, are you a theological minimalist? Beloved, I urge you to consider, if you are this, those texting Jesus lived in a culture and lived with this mentality. What can I get away with and still have favor with God? They came to Jesus with the mentality of, what's the minimum? What's the minimum? Many Christians today are functional Pharisees in this regard. They may believe upon Christ in faith. They may truly know that he has died for their sins. They may truly ascribe to the truth that the Bible is God's word, but they see God's word and his standards as burdensome when Christ says that it's all light. They, like the Pharisees, pluck the words of Jesus out of context that the whole of the law can be summed up in these two, love God and love people. That's great. Yes, that's true. But many will love God and they'll love neighbor and tolerance and not hate their sin. They profess to love God and neighbor, not because it's the joyful summation of the law, but because they find it to be the bare minimum. We are not called beloved, as his people, to be theological minimalists. We are called to be theological maximalists. Psalm 119, the largest chapter in the Bible, is all about loving the word of God, and not just some of it, not just the parts that you like, not the parts that culture would be like, oh, you're allowed to like these. Listen to Psalm 119.10. With part of my heart, I, I keep some of your, with my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wonder from your commandments. The whole heart, the whole law. Beloved, come unto the Lord this morning, seeking to live at the faith that you have with the maximum, not the minimum. After all, I want you to consider this. We do not wake up and consider what is the bare minimum that I need to drink and eat to survive today. We usually end the same day stuffed and overly hydrated, don't we? If Christ is the bread of life and he is the living water, come unto him, drink and eat without cost fully. Secondly, what is your standard? What is your rule of life? Dear listener, Jesus addressed an issue that we face today still because we are still just as hard-hearted as our fathers who fell in the wilderness. Jesus, God in the flesh, could have stated his opinion, giving fresh revelation, and it would have been fully authoritative. Yet, as our example, he pointed his enemies and his people where? To the scriptures. If the word made flesh, Christ himself looked unto the scriptures as the standard for all of life and godliness, faith and practice, what do you think that means for us? What do you think that means for his people? The lenses which we must wear to see all of life through are the lenses of the scriptures. The opinion of man does not matter in the end if it does not conform to the word of God. You know, in the 1990s, 
there was this, this huge explosion of, of Christian apparel, like shirts and all those things. You know, pick Jesus with the guitar pick and all these things. Lifeway had all these shirts. They're, they were gaudy and, and just terrible. But the most famous part of all of it, the most famous uh, facet of that uh, uh, Christian apparel explosion was what? A bracelet that said what? W-W-J-D. What would Jesus do? You know, the sentiment of that is actually correct. And here we have the example. In his earthly life, in this moment, what did Jesus do? When he was confronted, what did he do? He pointed to the authority, standard, the everlastingness, the truth of what? The scriptures. You know, we should get a new bracelet made and it should be the next thing that just takes the world by fire. Instead of WWJD, or maybe we have WWJD on one side and the other side is WSTS. What saith the scriptures? Beloved, no matter the circumstance, your heart must ask this question. Go to the scriptures for they truly speak to all of life and godliness. Build your life upon the word, even if it means you have to lop off your hand or pluck out your eye or lose friends and family. Lastly, do you have a biblical view of marriage? Beloved, do you have a biblical view of marriage? Is it as high as that of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you see it as merely a contract between two parties, all in order to receive some sort of tax break? Or do you see it as a covenant, an inseparable bond in blood, which God ordained from the beginning of time? Beloved, do you have a biblical view of marriage? What I say to husbands and wives, I say this day to would-be husbands and wives. Husbands, do you look upon your wife the way Adam looked upon Eve for that first time? In amazement, enthralled, in love, complete. Wives, do you look at your husband the same way Eve looked at Adam? She too was amazed. There to help. Joyful support. Desiring to cling to him desiring to complete him as he completes you. My friend, I ask you yet again, do you have a biblical view of marriage? For the scriptures do not have little to say, minimal to say, they have maximum to say about marriage. For it is used as a metaphor for the saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, his life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension are actually all symbolized in the institution of marriage. Ephesians 5, 22 through 31. It's lengthy. I want you to hear it though. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should also submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one. And Paul says, I tell you, this is a profound mystery, but it speaks of the gospel. Beloved, the gospel is seen in a godly robust Christian maximal marriage. Even into eternity, the glorious good news of the kingdom is described in what we had as our call to worship this morning as a wedding feast of the lamb, his, his bride all coming together. Beloved, we must have a high view of marriage because Christ himself is our high view of marriage. It's not just that he had a high view of marriage. He is 
our high view. Beloved, beloved, when God created Eve, God caused Adam to fall asleep and then God opened his side and took out a rib to fashion her and then presented her back unto him. Do you realize that this is a foreshadow of Christ and his bride? All the way back in Eden, this was actually a foreshadow of the gospel of the kingdom. What happens upon that cross? The great husband hangs his head and sleeps in death. And upon the cross, what also happens, beloved? They pierce his side. They pierce his side. And yet the second Adam arises, he awakens unto the life of resurrection. And yet his bride saw him, she saw his hands, she saw his side. And the saints from every generation, from the first Adam until the last sheep be brought into the fold, has proclaimed by the mouth of Thomas, my Lord and my God. That's right. Why does Hebrews 13.4, say, let the marriage be held in honor among all because it is a live action representation of the very gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you think it's the first thing Satan attacked? It's because it's his people, their savior. Dear listener, have a high view of marriage. If you do not, It's simple. Repent and start having a high view of marriage. Repent to your spouse. You who are married, maybe you have some sin that you've not confessed to them that's against them. You know what would be great? Repent to them. Then spouse that's receiving that uh, repentance, forgive as Christ has forgiven you. If you are here this morning and you have gone through that difficult division of divorce and there's some sort of decent relationship with your ex, you know what you need to do? Repent to them. Doesn't mean that, you know, things have to be perfect and restored, but you need to repent to them. If you are living in sin, unmarried, fornicating, playing married, stop, repent, be married, because the gospel. Oh, and one last thing, one last thing. A biblical view of marriage that's based on these scriptures right here and seeks to live it all out does so to the maximum, not just the minimum. Grace and peace to you. Let's pray.